Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Well, it's Wednesday morning and the conference has actually closed down the exhibition hall, but it's just getting started here. Check it out. 8.30am, there's 12 different uh, things happening. At 8.30, there's four labs and eight lectures. It's just crazy. And 6.30pm uh, dinner tonight with James Meigs, uh, the editor of Popular Mechanics magazine. Everyone's going to be turning up to that. But it just goes all day. It's unbelievable. Well, I'm sure glad these signs are here. I almost forgot. From 12.30 to 1.15pm today, they've got the general manager of the uh, global MCU business unit, the head honcho himself, out here. That's why uh, Renesis are taking this so seriously. They're sending out the man that regular Joe Bloggs can sit and ask questions of the man. I love it. Good morning, everybody. Morning. 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 Those of you who are morning people, morning, everybody. This is A19C Supernuts with free software. My name is DJ Glory. I'm a senior engineer at Red Hat. I work in the Global Engineering Services Group. We do primarily embedded systems, cross developers, etc. So, what does free software mean? A lot of people talk about free software. Not a lot of people actually know specifically what it means. And they think, well. It's not free because I can't do everything I want to do with it. Or it's not free because they charge me for it. It's not entirely about what the user wants. Free software is about what the software wants. The software wants to be free. And by free, I mean there are certain freedoms that the software grants to the users. And free software is about making sure that those freedoms are maintained. For starters, free software means that you have the freedom to run the program for any purpose. You can't write a piece of software and say, well, you can only use it the way I told you. You can only use it in these countries. You can only use it for these purposes. You can't compete with us with our own software. You have the freedom to run the software for any purpose that you want. You have the freedom to study how the program works and change it to make it do what you want. So if the software doesn't fit into your needs, you can make it fit into your needs. You have the freedom to redistribute copies to help your neighbor. Now, in the free software world, they talk about neighbors, but who are your neighbors in your business? They're your customers, your suppliers, your partners. Those are your neighbors. The ability to share your software, the tools you use with them, allows you to work together more efficiently. And finally, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. So if you get something, you have the, not only the option to enhance it to fit with your business practices, but then you can share it with your partners so that they have the same business practices and the same extensions. These lectures are so hectic. I'm glad I've got my personal printed itinerary. And then you don't know where you've got to go. It's like one of 16 different uh, lecture or lab rooms. But luckily, on the back of your badge, you've got your little map showing you where to go. It's brilliant. I love it. We're almost ready for the next session. People are lining up, checking out the board to see what's in there. Aha, just in time. Found it. Open hardware with open tools. I love open hardware. DJ Delore is given the uh, lab. It's going to be a hands-on lab where we can muck around with open source hardware tools. Well worth checking out. Let's go. Okay. One more for PC. Yeah. Testing. We're in. Testing. Oh, we've got some, we've got some hardware to play with. We've got can, little micro board, LCD, and I think we're going to do example apps using uh, <coughs> all open source tools. Oh, you turned your mid box into the. And there's DJ. He's getting ready. He's nervous. Smile for the EV ah, vlog, DJ. It's all going to blow up. <laughs> and that would be good. And this is open source hardware. This is open hardware. Open hardware. Excellent. Like a slightly different concept. With open source software, it's people sharing one's zero. With open hardware, it's more of a, well, you can't share the hardware. What you do is you share the design files that go with it. Excellent. So people will publish their schematics and their, their, their layout and let other people make the same board and 
program the board, all of the specs for the boards are going to be published so that people who want to play with it can play with it. And this lab is slightly different from other labs you may have gone to. This is more of a guided tour of the state of art free software for EDA. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bet money that we're going to put them on 0, 1, 2, 3. Yeah. All the software on the laptop you're using right now is 100% free software. <laughs> no such thing as a The question of libraries just came up, and, and I'll talk about that while you're working on it. Is, this suite comes with a collection of symbols, and the layout editor comes with a selection of footprints. And we try to cover most of the common things. We like to follow the IEC guidelines for, for what they're named and which ones get in there. But uh, in, in our experience, nearly everybody who's putting together a circuit is going to be working with something that's different. So we assume that as part of your learning experience, you will learn how to create new symbols and footprints. And they're created right within the tool itself. You, you just draw them and save them. So we, we don't try to have a 100% complete library because that's a lot of effort, and people are going to have to do their own thing anyway, eventually. And now all the sources right here? Yep. Wiki wait, wait and timer? Yep. Oh, well, well, if you un uh, open that, you'll see all the sources. Hello. Hello. Well, it's, it was my whole development directory. I just dumped it in. <laughs> it did. Um, there's, there's probably some other things in there as well. Besides. <laughs> Shall we ship Linky board? Did it work? It sure did. Oh, there it is. Look. Pretty fancy. Look, it works. All with open source. You make yours blink? Yes, yeah, it's blinking. Okay. Woohoo! So. one. <laughs> Winner. Yeah. All right, I guess I'm six then, huh? Which, which of the good prices do you want? Oh, goodness. Both nice. Nice. Uh, Ooh. Starbucks. Prizes. Oh, Starbucks and iTunes. Yeah, iTunes. Oh, my wife would be happy if I got iTunes for Okay, my wife wanted the Starbucks. <laughs> Thanks for attending. I hope you enjoyed experiencing the free software alternative for EDH. Who liked this? <laughs> At least two days. I hope you weren't having to use a touchpad. No, 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 two no. Two days? No. At least no. two days? What are you <laughs> Actually, I, d I did this at night over the course of about two weeks. Okay. Um, I think somebody's going to all those, those all that Steam stuff's available. Those available. parts and the f all that stuff is available for. Yeah. And that was designed. This was, this was designed 100% with free software, GDA PCB layout, and I'm doing all the programming using GCC. This is this is my equivalent of the RX 62N development board. Very so, nice. Is it a full layer? This is a four-layer board, uh, manufactured in Germany. It uses 6-6 six, six rules, so nothing out of the ordinary. I use strictly prototyping services. Yep. Uh, it wasn't that expensive, and I bought all the parts through DigiKey except for the 6-2N itself, which I got from Renaissance. If, was there anything you did specifically for this company in Germany to make sure? No. Um, the, the, I had the design rules in PCB set for their design rules, so oh, okay. it wouldn't allow me, and I do do design rule checking, but like if I'm doing something in my basement, I have to adjust the the edges to compensate for undercutting. Yeah, yeah. And when I do paste, the, the paste layer that comes out, it was actually post-processed off of this. Uh, for each pad, paste layers are the size of the pad, and I shrink them down by a certain amount based on the geometry of the pad and some other rules that I might throw in in order to move things around. Uh, and, and also, if you look really, really carefully at the bottom, you can see that where the traces hit uh, pins, they flare out. Mm -hmm. Those teardrops are added after the fact. It's not something I do in PCB. It's all done in a post-processor. No, so on the Gerbers? No, on the PCB itself, the, the uh, .PCB. It takes one, generates okay. another one that has all of the extra things in it. But I don't want to edit it with all that extra stuff, and I want to edit the original. So you can see the teardrops in the Gerber file? You can yeah. see them in the Gerber file. You can actually edit the final board after the post-processing, run design rule, check again, 
and make sure that the post-processing didn't change, you know, violating the design rules, then generate your Gerber's assembly. And so that's all done in PCB, you're saying? The post-processing? No, I, I wrote a script. A script, okay. That uh, the PCB uses an interpreted a little language internally. Yeah. So what I do is I, I do my own edits and save it, and then I have a script that okay. runs PCB in batch mode with all of these other commands to do the extra steps that I want okay. and saves it under a different name. Okay. And then the make file then goes invokes it and has, it uses the command line options yeah. to export the Gerbers instead of using the GUI like you guys did. It, it generates all the Gerbers, all the photorealistic stuff, all the EPS, all the web pages. It's all done in a make file. So I save my copy and I type make and boom, everything happens. It takes about five minutes to run through the whole mess. Okay. And then all the files are ready there, the tar balls sent out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all done. Very nice. Can you do, can you do a... Uh, uh, the way you do the, the way you do planes in it is you draw polygons. We, we don't do the inverse planes like some people do because some fabs don't like that. So we do it with polygons. It allows you to do split planes as well. You draw a big rectangle over your board, and then you grab the thermal tool and you just go click, 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 and it, it changes to one of the eight different types of thermals that we support. Or you can make solids if you're doing like a, all the switching power supplies in here are all solid. Um, do you see Jita being involved with the open source hardware, the new open source hardware stand? We're trying to promote the idea that if you're making open hardware, it's not really open if the tools you need are not themselves open. Very true. Now, KiCad, Jita, you know, we kind of don't really mind which one you use as long as you use something. But if you use a proprietary package, like Eagle, like Eagle or Orcad or Altium, to produce a design, is the design really open? Granted, it's you can not. use it mm -hmm. for whatever you want, but you can't change it unless you buy the tools. So we're trying to encourage the open hardware specs, the initiatives, mm -hmm. to specify that open hardware is not truly open unless the file formats are open as well. Maybe if, if at least if you can interpret the files and do something with the files yes. as opposed to having a completely closed file system, we'd like them to use open source ETA tools. But at the very least, you need to be able to work with the ETA files. And how much does GEDA cost? GEDA costs nothing. Completely free. Maybe a penny if you have to pay for your ISP. How do you make your money? Volume.
so that the new innovation, internal innovation, so that we uh, uh, we will be able to catch up the customer's barriers. Uh, so the RX is the most impressive. This is an official answer. <laughs> In my career, and as I explained, uh, I have studied from the Android NCU designers. And during my career, I uh, once joined the joint program with Intel. And at that time, the Intel had a broad, uh, product portfolio, including the uh, MCU, such as the 8051 or 8096. Maybe the old person uh, will remember this. <laughs> and for me, the internal design uh, disclosed by Intel for the 8051 was a big surprise. Uh, at that time, uh, their design is very aggressive, use the new technologies, and uh, uh, in my career, the 8051 design. Of course, that, that was that done by myself, but that was the most impressive design for me. The, uh, this is a kind of a non volatile memory for next generation. And uh, uh, the mechanism physics uh, to remember the data is quite different from the conventional and uh, flash technologies. It's uh, based on the man, uh, man, magneto electronic uh, effect. And so the <coughs> Lunasas and the uh, before merger Lunasas technology uh, was the leader of the uh, M -Line. And also NBC Electronics in, in R and D levels, uh, they move themselves into the next generation M structure. And now we are uh, preparing the 90 nano uh, the M uh, health technology. Uh, but to be honest, uh, the my personal impression is M1 is very attractive, but many people consider that it is just a replacement of flash. Then, uh, flash for flash, for example, our clock library technology called that Monos has already uh, confirmed to have a high scalability to refine process to 40 nano or 28 nano. Then, uh, for M1, uh, now I'm looking for is a killer application for M1. For example, MRAM is a non volatile memory, but at the same time, the reply cycle is very fast. Meaning that the MRAM is a, a, a non volatile memory and at the same time, a RAM, conventional RAM. So, this kind of universal feature uh, will, uh, give, will give some new innovative functionality, but so far, the RSS uh, technology and also MEC electronics uh, was not successful. Uh, to find out this kind of uh, technology. And the Wednesday night dinner event has once again, they've transformed it into a lovely sit down dinner table event. dive into the area that all of you are involved in, embedded design, uh, ubiquitous computing, and look at how the trends are coming. So many of you working in different areas of this, see how these things are coming together in a way that will reshape our lives. So the first question is, can we define ubiquitous computing? Some people would say the first ubiquitous computers are, are more or less current versions of smartphones. Other people would go back a little farther and look for um, the first generation PCs. Okay, how many people have one of these? Networked ubiquitous computer was the ATM. Uh, the first one was introduced in 1969 um, at a chemical bank on Long Island. Uh, I think their ad said something like, "On Monday morning, our bank will open and never close again." And that's basically what happened. Um, and Donald Wetzel, who more or less invented the, um, the ATM, he knew exactly what this meant. It wasn't just a better way to do banking. This was the first machine that was going to teach people how to interact with uh, an intelligent device. And uh, it's hard to remember now, but it was, a, it was a, a, a real learning curve to get people comfortable with the machine actually handling your money. Uh, you know, if you think about it, all the technologies we're talking about, they may seem to offer all kinds of benefits, but they have trade-offs too. Imagine there was a time when if you wanted your money, you'd walk into a bank and a person would look you in the eye, often greet you by name and say, how can I help you? The entire transaction was organized around your need and the way you, uh, you, the questions that you had. 
in contrast, going and, and interacting with an ATM means you have to accept the, uh, the menu and the paradigm that the machine imposes on you. We take it for granted now, but it was, um, it was a challenge for some people. As recently as the mid to late 80s, I remember in New York, there were, um, there were still banks advertising, well, you know, at our bank, you can still talk to a real person. I remember looking at my wife and going, I don't want to talk to a real person. <laughs> Interesting little known Renesis fact time. Third biggest semiconductor manufacturer in the world. Intel up here, fighting it out with Samsung, and then there's Renesis, number three. Who knew?